Oh, it's not like it used to be. <laughs> For millions of years, birds had these islands to themselves. Only they could ride the winds and overcome the country's isolation. Last, lonely, remote, the oceans cut off this land from all others. When man came, much later in the piece, he too had to come to terms with the elements. When man did get here, that lowland there was a wilderness of swamp, and these hills were still continuously carpeted in trees. All the men who did reach New Zealand played a part in transforming the face of the land, and they did so more ruthlessly, more completely, and in much shorter time than in any country anywhere. So that today, native forest is hard to find, and practically all our soils are man-made. Hills have been leveled and there are just about as many artificial lakes as there are natural ones. In this series of programs, we're going to demonstrate just how compelling, just how staggering those changes have been. But there's one thing that man hasn't changed, and it, in fact, has been the making of New Zealand and New Zealanders, the weather. central Tasman Sea, and from it a cold front extends southeastwards across the South Island, between South Westland and South Canterbury. For the coastal areas of Southland and Otago, fresh squally southwest winds with some heavy showers, but occasional clear sunny periods. The weather improving with longer fine periods by morning. A deep depression southwest of Stewart Island is moving rapidly eastwards and there is a strong northwesterly flow over the Tasman Sea for the west coast of the South Island and Fiordland. Strong northwest winds with heavy rain and widespread low cloud, turning later in the day to the west or southwest. With the wind change, the rain will become less persistent. Future outlook, showers and scattered cloud. A tropical storm lying 200 kilometres to the west of the Auckland Peninsula is moving steadily southeastwards. As it advances, gale force winds are spreading southwards. Now for Northland, Auckland and Bay of Plenty, northeast winds up to gale force, cloud thickening and rain spreading south by evening. Some heavy and persistent falls in areas exposed to the northeast, especially on the coast of the Coromandel Peninsula and northern Bay of Plenty. Warm and humid.
direction they come, the air masses approaching New Zealand are laden with moisture. The rain they bring made this a land of trees. The New Zealand combination of rain all the year round and no extremes of temperature is found in very few places in the world. It's our greatest blessing and we owe it to that encircling sea. When man arrived, trees were everywhere. They covered all but the highest mountain ranges and they grew in all but the driest and the windiest spots. Many of them were exceptionally valuable timber trees, none quite so precious as the cowrie. Now all but gone. Among the rotting remnants of those cowries in Northland, man now grows something which provides him with a regular annual income. Growing grass is not always as easy elsewhere in New Zealand as it is here in this rainy, winterless northern peninsula. New Zealand climate does have its light and shade, its regional variety. Indeed, some parts of the country are cut off almost entirely from the influence of the encircling sea. <laughs> Here in winter, the air is clear and cold and dry. I'm in the ring, so I want one in the ring there. Immigrant Scots from the coldest part of Britain find themselves at home. By the time the winds reach this part of New Zealand, they've dropped their moisture as rain or snow on the other side of the ranges. It's as if central Otago were a thousand kilometers from the ocean. But elsewhere, other New Zealanders choose to live as close as they can to the warmth of the sea. New Zealanders enjoy a range and variety of climate as great as you'll find in the whole of the United States. I must admit that the sea and the surf and the sun were amongst the things I had in mind when I came to New Zealand 40 years ago from the industrial north of England. There you'd be lucky to get one day in a year as good as this. I lived at first in Christchurch and I liked it very much indeed. But like thousands of other New Zealanders, at the first opportunity that presented itself, I joined the drift to the north. Nine out of ten New Zealanders live within sight of the sea. More and more of them in the north, and especially here near Auckland. Looking out to sea, we turn our backs on the difficult country, and we forget that three quarters of New Zealand is steep and broken and mountainous. Most of the mountains are in the South Island. 
The Southern Alps are New Zealand's dominant landmark. They divide the South Island in two. The mountains have a climate of perpetual ice and snow. Any mark made by man is difficult to find. Although the Southern Alps repel most people, they've always attracted climbers young enough, fit enough and experienced enough to enjoy them. But until the turn of the century, it took even the most accomplished climber three days simply to get himself from Timaru on the coast to the hermitage at Mount Cook. Cutting down that travel time, making the journey more comfortable, required new ideas, new skills, new methods. But before you develop new methods, new skills, you've got to have a vision of the future and a firm conviction that it can be achieved. The New Zealand we know was largely fashioned by men who had both, both imagination and determination. One of them was a South Canterbury farmer and farm contractor. And he loved these mountains and he wanted other New Zealanders to enjoy them just as he did. His name was Rodolph Wigley. In 1906, Wigley had been the first to drive a motor car from Timaru to the Hermitage. The journey took 22 hours, but at least he now knew that it could be done. In 1908, he imported this 40 horsepower, nine-seater Darak service car from France to take tourists to the Hermitage. Not in three days or in the 22 hours that it had taken him in 1906, but within the hours of daylight. What a nerve it must have taken to shuttle those first tourists to the Hermitage on shingle roads across rivers without bridges and not a garage or a mechanic within as much as 100 kilometers. Wigley's vision paid off. Within a few years, tourist parties, large and small, were enjoying the new accessibility of the mountains. And this was only the start. Rodolph Wigley's soaring imagination had yet barely taken off. After World War I, British military aircraft were going begging. Wigley asked the New Zealand government for one and got seven. One of them made the first ever flight from Timaru to Auckland. From that flight on, Wigley established firmly in his mind an even bolder dream, the possibility of a regular passenger air service along a main trunk line from Auckland to Invercargill. Inevitably, a branch line would take passengers from Christchurch to Mount Cook and to another of his favorite tourist spots, Queenstown. Rodolph Wigley was a New Zealander far ahead of his time. His son, Harry, inherited not only his father's love of the mountains, but also his burning interest in aeroplanes. They both learned to fly in the 1930s. Harry Wigley became a fighter pilot in the Second World War. He returned to take over his father's company. Harry 
Wigley's own flying in the Alps had shown him that the most spectacular mountain scenery still lay beyond the reach of all but the hardiest climbers. If only he could land his plane up there on ice or snow. That would need skis on his aircraft. But to take off and land again at the Hermitage would still need wheels. Skis, then, would have to be retractable. In 1955, Harry Wigley was the first man to land a plane fitted with retractable skis high on the Tasman Glacier. Eventually, tourists followed. Today, they come in their thousands and from all over the world, so that Rodolf Wigley's vision of 60 years ago has been made into a reality. The Wigleys have destroyed the isolation of the mountains. They've created a whole new industry, too. Elsewhere in New Zealand, ingenuity and innovations of the same sort have transformed the face of the land. Here, the trick has been to leave it just as it was. The ski planes also take skiers and their skis much higher up the glacier. And from there, it's an uninterrupted nine kilometer glide, downhill all the way. The only marks anybody leaves are gone next morning. But lower down, nature herself has disfigured the glacier. As the ice melts, the glacier shrinks to expose the load of rock and debris, its ground from the slopes of the mountain. Where the glacier terminates, water takes over. Now, icy torrents pick up the glacier's load. Today, tourists brave the Tasman River in rafts, tumbled along by the surge of water, just as countless boulders and masses of shingle were swept along by enormous floods in prehistoric times. Such floods, repeated time after time after time, built up the Canterbury Plains and the plains of the Mackenzie country. The rivers have dwindled to occupy only a fraction of their former beds. They're now no longer capable of shifting the mass of shingle. Indeed, man has taken over. Now he decides where the river shall run and what they shall do. He's tamed the rivers of the Mackenzie Basin, the Pukaki, the Tekapo, the Ohau, and channeled them through canals deep enough to float an inter-island ferry. He's harnessed that water power to produce hydroelectricity.
Even in the enormous sweep of the Mackenzie country, man's handwriting remains impressive. Ever since Europeans came here, man's always had the urge to meddle with nature and to take on and to overcome the obstacles he found in his way. And here, he found obstacles enough to demand all his ingenuity and skills. This is the modern counterpart of the sort of earth-moving equipment that a Mackenzie Country run holder started to design and to manufacture in the workshop on his sheep station 50 years ago. By comparison, his pioneer version seems crude and primitive. But hauled by what was one of the first caterpillar tractors in New Zealand, it worked. This Mackenzie country squatter used his scoop to excavate two hectares of shingle that those rivers had dumped here. He needed a more regular supply of power for his fast expanding workshop. Until then, he'd simply diverted water from the river to his generator along an open, shallow water race. Now, while he and his workshop staff played ice hockey on the dam, the water flowing from beneath the ice kept his generator turning. And such was this do-it-yourselfers response to any challenge that he even built a combined mechanical sweep scraper and polisher to save time preparing the ice for play. The dam and the generator and the busy workshop were all miles out of town in the heart of the Mackenzie country on a sheep station. This one man designed and constructed an endless range of devices from earth movers to pumps and air conditioning units. He did it in the workshop he built between the homestead and the wool shed. Everything was a response to the stimulus of this distinctive New Zealand landscape. Local solutions to local problems. But that extraordinarily inventive New Zealander is remembered most of all for something else, something quite different. This old boat has in it the first of the second type of jet propulsion units designed and built in the early 1950s here at Irishman's Creek by Bill Hamilton. He tested it out on this dam. Right. Sir William Hamilton, as he became, first experimented with the jet boat on his dam at Irishman's Creek. But as Lady Hamilton remembers, the real challenge and the real inspiration came from those strange Mackenzie country shingle rivers. We always used to go camping. One day we were coming back from Wanaka, and we found a little road going down to where well, the confluence of the rivers, the Pukaki and the Oha and the Tekapo. It was lovely, absolutely lonely and quiet. I said, oh, 
do let's camp here, it's lovely. And Bill looked up and he said, well, it'd be all right, there'd be nothing to do unless you had a boat. And he said, if only you could get a boat to go up. So then he finally started one and the first jet, I think, would only do about 11 miles an hour. Of course, it made it horribly exciting. And then when he got the water coming out at the back instead of under the boat, then that increased the speed enormously. It, it always say that he did it to go around his sheep. Of course he didn't. He did it really for fun, for the feeling of exploring a river. There can hardly be a better illustration of how man has triumphed over the unaccustomed elements he found in this new land. Sir William Hamilton developed the jet boat for fun, and in New Zealand they're still used for pleasure. Elsewhere, they're used as fishing boats, search and rescue craft, and patrol boats. This, though, is their natural habitat. The jet boat's a typical New Zealand response to a typical New Zealand situation. Despite jet boats and ski planes, there are in New Zealand still remote, little-known areas cut off from the rest of the country. In the North Island, in the Uriwiras, isolation comes not from ice and snow and lofty elevations, Here, it's a question of damp, impenetrable bush. Just about the only people who disturb the silence of the rainforest are hunters. <laughs> The hunters penetrate the forest in pursuit of animals that man has brought to New Zealand. Deer, pigs and possums. Until the Europeans came, this land knew neither grazing nor browsing animals. Sometimes even hunters born and bred in the Urawiras get lost. All right, fellas, the position is this. For the last two or three months, Selena and Naughty Aparana have been possuming from the campsite where we're marked here. Each day they've been traveling up this... In the winter of 1980, the of the all New Zealand held its breath for a week when two Maori girls went out to check a line of possum traps and didn't come back. They were due back at this campsite at 3 o'clock that afternoon. They haven't returned. from that particular map and I'll give you a description of the party. Search and rescue is contemporary New Zealand's response to the challenges posed by terrain like this.
we found a number of articles of um, clothing belonging to the girls. Uh, we found this hat uh, a short distance from their camp. We know that they were in possession of uh, this hat when they left the camp the last time they were seen. Uh, we've also found this shirt on top of a ridge very near to a trapping line they were about to check. I feel we, we are becoming concerned about their welfare now. The conditions have been fairly severe and their clothing is uh, inadequate. Search and rescue depends in part on up-to-date technology. Rutahuna base from party one. We have nothing to report. Over. But as hope fades, the girl's father places his faith in the Maori's traditional knowledge of the land. Or, uh, uh, you know, I have confidence you know, that they will be found and uh, never gave up hope. We have our own methods of, you know, hoping that they'll be looked after. It, it have to be that way. It's a reasonable conclusion, I think, that those two girls survived because they were Polynesians. Their forebears had known this land intimately for generations and long ago had learned how to live in the bush. It's another example of how the land itself provides the stimulus for the acquisition and development of skills. Maori's skills were simpler, of course, than the Wigleys or Bill Hamilton's, but exactly the same principle was involved. The Maoris passed on their intimate knowledge of the land and detailed information about their ancestors just as they passed on their myths and legends from one generation to another by word of mouth. Inga wa o mu anuat, ka hari nga tua ka nao Maui ki te hika, ka tae ki te taunga, ka pike ake Maui, ka ki nga tua ka nao poko kohu a nao wai koi mea ke hari mai ki te hika. Ka noho puku Maui, ka mirimiri tana matau. Te matau nei, i hanga mai, anō te kauai o tana tupuna, nō muriranga whenu. Ka kia tu Maui, humai he mau nu māko, i hi anau kia mau iau te tahi i ka nui. Ka ki ngā tua kana kāo, kore mā te hoa te mau nu māko. Nā ka paua e Maui tana ihu ka heke te toto, ka penu penu atu te toto ki roti te muka, koe te rako tana mau nu, ka tukua tana taura ki te moana. Ki hei nei roa, Ka kai mai hei ka pehe te nui. Ka karanga ki ana tuakana, ea ku tuakana ue hei ka tāku hei ka nui. Ka hari atu ngā tuakana, nā lātou huhutu tika nei, pehe te roa e hūtjana, te puta ngāke, ko tei ka Māui, ko Aotearoa. Nā ka ki a Māui, e hoki nei au ki Hawaiki. Ki te tiki i te tahi tohunga hei hiki i te tapu o tau taku ika. Taku kōrero ke koutou, tia ki nga tei ka nei, kau e tuki no tia. Te ngaro ngā tua Māui kā tapatapa i naka tūki no tia teika e titiro atu nei tātou i te nei wā. The North Island certainly looks as if it's been hacked about and chopped up. And in several places there's clear evidence that New Zealand has indeed been raised from beneath the sea. This cutting on the Napier Taupo Highway is 700 metres above sea level. Yet here, there are thousands and thousands of shells from a great variety of shellfish. They obviously lived and died like cockles and pippies today in some shallow estuary. And some force or other raised them hundreds of meters above the sea. Few motorists who speed through this cutting ever notice the evidence of the violent forces in New Zealand's geological past.
Yet the landmarks left behind in the unfolding of the geological history of New Zealand are laid out everywhere, sometimes in orderly sequence, sometimes in violent disarray. To understand the basic structure and the mountainous nature of New Zealand, it's important to appreciate that it sits astride the zone of contact between two major segments of the Earth's crust. Plates, geologists call them, and they float like rafts on the Earth's molten interior. One of those plates extends from the zone of contact in New Zealand here, all the way across the Tasman and Australia into Southeast Asia, and the other extends under the whole of the Pacific Ocean. The last time these two plates came into violent contact with each other in this part of the Pacific was about 12 million years ago. And at that time, the underlying rocks in the New Zealand area were old and hard and brittle and submerged beneath the sea, except for the oldest of all here in what is now the South Island. As the two plates ground against each other, the enormous pressures they created cracked and fractured the old hard rocks, creating separate blocks. Some were forced up, and some were forced down. The first one to emerge from beneath the sea was this one here. It moved southwestwards, rising as it went. It ultimately became the main alpine block and was at one stage several times higher than Mount Cook itself is today. When it struck these, the oldest rocks in New Zealand, it split them apart, tore them into two, and like a gigantic bulldozer, it shoved this half southwards ahead of it. This became Fiordland, and this Stewart Island, and this half still forms most of Marlborough and Nelson. The nose of the bulldozer itself disintegrated under the pressures of contact into a series of smaller blocks that today form the basins and ranges of Otago and South Canterbury. Later, the tail of the alpine block flicked and split up into a series of parallel blocks. They today are the Kaikoura ranges in Marlborough. The structure of the North Island is much younger. So too is its mountain system. The blocks there, though, are much less massive, less elevated, narrower, and roughly parallel. And they continue right through to the Bay of Plenty. This is the basic structure of New Zealand. Its most important element is the Alpine Fault, one of the greatest structural features on the Earth's crust. Here it is. It runs straight and uninterrupted for hundreds of kilometers, and though it's less distinctive in the North Island, it runs through to the Bay of Plenty and far out into the Pacific. Although this latest phase of mountain building started 12 million years ago, it's still in progress today, especially as you go further and further north. So it's in the North Island interior that you find New Zealand's still active and recently active volcanoes. But not all volcanic activity builds conical mountains like these. Look, for example, what happened at Taupo. Lake Taupo sits in the basin created by an enormous explosive eruption. Here, where the Earth's crust is thinnest, it's simply split wide open, ejecting into the atmosphere millions of tons of fiery pumice ash. The ash seared and buried everything in its path as far out as the Bay of Plenty and even across the ranges into Poverty Bay. Wherever the ash piled up as much as a meter high, it created a desert that's bare and barren still today, except for moss and tussock and scrub.
Here again, you can read the story for yourself. This time, in the banks of the Rangitaiki River on the volcanic plateau. Each of these layers of ash represents a separate explosion. This grey layer here may well be several thousand years old. And the latest, way up on top there, that's 950 years old. And the next one, that's due any day. Out in the Bay of Plenty, the process of mountain building proceeds before our very eyes. White Island is the most continuously active of all New Zealand's volcanoes. It's a risky business just setting foot on White Island, even if you're not caught by this week's eruption of ash, you still run the risk of being gassed by poisonous fumes. And yet, the people of New Zealand have built their largest city amidst a cluster of volcanoes, very much like this one. of course is that for the time being Auckland's volcanoes are asleep. There are more than a score of them. Many, like Mount Eden, have been dormant now for 20 or 30,000 years. One of them though, Rangitoto, has been asleep for only 250 years. It could wake up again any day. Or another volcano, a new one, could be born tomorrow. It's not really a question of whether there'll be another Big Bang, but when. The odds, though, on whether it will happen this year, next year, or a hundred years hence, are impossible to calculate. But then New Zealanders have always enjoyed taking a gamble. A race course like this may actually be a very good place to demonstrate what a late starter New Zealand has been in the course of the world's history. The track here at Alexandra Park in Auckland is just a thousand meters round, and this horse is going to pace one lap of the track for us. Naturally, it's not a race, it's not even a time trial. 
but will use its leisurely 1,000 meter journey to represent the 6,000 million years of the Earth's history that have elapsed so far. And as it goes, we'll point out at what stage in the course of that history New Zealand made its appearance. For our starting point, we take the moment when the Earth spun off from the Sun. It took an extraordinarily long time, a third of the Earth's history, 2,000 million years, simply to cool and to solidify. had run three quarters of its course before New Zealand's first rocks were even formed. New Zealand wasn't thrust up from beneath the sea to form for the first time a separate land until now. But the events that really matter for us today can be separated only by the photo finish camera. That alpine block emerges from the ocean. Man first walks upright on Earth. Man finally reaches New Zealand. In that immeasurably brief instant of geological time, man's achievements here in New Zealand have been quite spectacular. In fact, in little more than a thousand years, man has done more to transform the face of this land than nature herself did in a hundred thousand years before man left the first human footprint in the sand on some New Zealand shore. It's been my good fortune to spend most of my life studying out in the open the marks that men have made here. And learning how we've handled this environment, how we've molded the New Zealand Habitat has been a most congenial task. I've enjoyed, indeed, I still savour every moment of it. The chance to see New Zealand again, and to see it in a new way, has been one of the memorable experiences of my life. What impressed me this time has not been so much the extent and variety of the stamp man's imprinted on this land, but the pace at which, in town and country alike, the changes are still going on. Faster today than ever before. <laughs> 